system, the health care system, emergency management, security, the public service, business, attitudes, democracy, and our economy generally. The world is in a crisis, and our country is in the midst of it. Many people globally and here locally are no longer able to provide for their families because of this pandemic. Civil servants in St. Kitts and Nevis are among the fortunate. To date, we are still enjoying a full salary and all the benefits we have become accustomed to. Hotel workers, tour operators, breeders, bus drivers, construction workers, restaurant workers, just to name a few, are less fortunate. These wage workers who depend on the earnings from a hard day's work for survival are most adversely affected. We are asking bus drivers to carry their buses at 60% capacity, which is a 40% pay cut. We are asking others to hold strain until we get through this turbulent path in our nation's history. We expect some to make sacrifices, but truth be told, we all have to make personal sacrifices to get through this pandemic. For some, the sacrifice is giving up some personal freedom and staying at home to prevent the spread of this deadly virus. For others, it's a call to service, bringing us out on the front lines to use our skills, knowledge, and God-given talent to protect the vulnerable and the less fortunate. In this time of crisis, therefore, some of us may be called upon to work beyond the call of duty. The police may have to do more patrolling to enforce the curfews. Teachers may have to learn a new and more challenging way of teaching students in virtual classrooms during the lockdown. Farmers may have to spend longer hours in the hot sun tilling the soil so we can feed ourselves locally. One test of our resilience and commitment to the greater good of our nation is how we behave when our country is in crisis. If at this time we are able to live true to our country's motto, country above self, we would have made a significant stride as a nation. Doctors and nurses across the globe have been working overtime to combat this pandemic. I am grateful to the Almighty God that here locally we have been able to contain the virus thus far below a level which it could overwhelm our health system. We have augmented our staff with help from overseas. We have decreased significantly our elective procedures and have also seen a significant drop in crime and injuries related to crime presenting to the emergency room. During this period, we have had a significant drop in hospital visits and hospital admissions such that our hospital occupancy has decreased significantly. We have therefore seen an ease on the demand made on the healthcare workers at the institution while we continue to battle in the community to contain COVID-19. We continue to remain vigilant, however, and brace for surging cases while we re-energize ourselves during this brief lull in our workload at the hospital. We have no idea when this virus will leave us or where it will leave us. We may well be in defense and mitigation mode until a vaccine is available. While we are making great strides in the fight here, we are a part of a global economy. We will also be affected by the impact of the pandemic on other countries on which we rely for tourists, students, investment, and trade. This crisis could affect us for decades. There will, we expect, be time for a full and comprehensive review of the impact of the pandemic, of our response to it, and our recovery from it. The middle of the crisis is certainly not the time for such a review. We recognize the value of all our healthcare workers and frontline workers to our country in this war against the deadly virus, and to them we will be eternally grateful. It is, however, very premature and irresponsible to start at this time a discussion on salary increases for the healthcare sector or any other sector within the public service. 
I can tell you that the view I share on this matter is the view of the majority of doctors and nurses in our federation. It is also the view shared by those in the general public with whom I interact on a daily basis. Last night, while speaking to my grandson, he called me a hero. When I asked him why he chose to call me a hero, his response was, because you're fighting the coronavirus on TV every day, Grandpa. <laughs> it is this show of appreciation for what we do as healthcare workers that gives us the drive to continue this fight and not the promise of money. We understand the importance of what we do, but we do not wish to over... Oh, it is a 25 minutes after and the singular action of each of us will help us get through this pandemic. There will be a lot of time after to discuss salary raises and hazard pay. For now, I beg each and every one of us to get on board with this fight if we are to survive as a nation. That is my answer. Our it is at 25 minutes after. Yeah, 26 minutes. Tune to 1 FM 98.9, the time approximately 29 minutes moving away from the 5 o'clock hour. We apologize for the interruption and the rebroadcasting of a prior presentation that was, that was due to circumstances completely beyond our control here at 1 FM 98.9. Whenever they start with the real COVID up daily update. We'll take you there.
And we now take you to the daily COVID update. April 2020, I am Les Roy Williams. Thank you very much for joining us. Those of you on Facebook, YouTube, ZIZ Television and Radio, and Caribbean Broadcasting Network, owned by Mr. Andrew Cox in the Virgin Islands. Today we continue to update you and to bring you the most relevant information with respect to how we in St. Kitts and Nevis are managing the COVID-19 pandemic. It has been a rather challenging time for all of us and we have had to make many adjustments to our lives, the way we go about business. The life is not the same, and it will take a very long time for life to come back to uh, as, as we know it. Today we have a number of presenters, including the SCASPA. We have Skellig here. We have the police, our chief medical officer, and Mr. Samuel. I would like to begin by inviting to address us the Chief Executive Officer of the St. Christopher Air and Seaports Authority, SCASPA, Mr. Mr. Don James. Mr. James. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, in, the, in my immediate presence, and you who are engaged via radio, television, and very other media platforms, like all other essential institutions and groups who have been in the forefront in ensuring that our federation the people of St. Kitts and Nevis are well served during this period of unprecedented challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The details of which have been well documented, explained, and unless you are in space, have experienced the effects. The St. Christopher A and Support SCASPA welcomes this opportunity to present to you the critical role it has performed and continues to perform during the crisis. It might not, might not have been showcased as other essential institutions and or groupings recently, but it has been silently executing its mandate by being on the forefront ensuring very little, if any, disruption in the supply chain of food, medicine, and other essential cargo to the supermarkets, the pharmacies, and even in the village shops. Scourges both the air and sea ports is positioned at the critical points in the supply chain the entry points or gateways to the Federation where any minor disruption can have significant impact on the availability of critical food and other cargo supplies reaching the people. During the coffee periods and the partial closure of the Federation borders, scarce operations continued with near total closure at the airport cessation of activities at the cruise pier terminal, but full shuttle at the cargo port. On a daily basis, conforming to the social distances protocol, teams of CASPER workers have been diligently working to ensure none or minimal disruptions 
at the cargo port by ensuring that the private sector is properly serviced and by extension the nation. One of the obvious benefits of Casper's contribution during the period of uncertainty and fear is its role in abating panic shopping. We have seen that over the time, as persons have been assured that there would be a constant supply of goods to the supermarkets and the pharmacies and other essential providers, the long lines at these establishments have significantly shrunk. No need for excessive hoarding or the establishment of what I call mini supermarkets in individual homes, creating unnecessary waste. The dedication of Casper's work, Casper's work teams has assisted in satisfying customers' wants and also when they're demanded and uh, they're spending as little as possible in getting them. And what has been very, very critical at this point in time is the stabilization of prices over the period to date. I am sure that panic shopping episodes that we saw in the early periods of the imposition of the curfew were the most challenging times for the COVID-19 task force, especially the security forces. The greatest potential exposure and transmission threat was at, it pe at its peak when, and more so, at the long lines. The social distancing threat at these establishments has significantly been reduced to the reduction in those long lines, worming their way for extended distances, and I'm almost tempted to say miles in our local parlance. However, Casper did not go it alone. As is, usually, as is usually done, there was much collaboration with its critical stakeholders. One such is the customs. Through close collaboration with the management of the customs, both the business sector and private individuals were able to move cargo. Although in the initial stages of the curfew, preference was given to essential goods, that has now been extended to all cargo. Casper's strategy, COVID strategy. The authority, the authority sees the critical role it has to play in the wider national strategy in the management and holding at bay the spread of COVID-19. The authority took early measures to ensure that the staff is fully apprised of the seriousness of the impending pandemic. The authority would like to thank Chairman Mr. Samuel and CMO Dr. Laws for their rapid response to our request to engage the staff on the nature of the virus, potential avenues through which it is transmitted, and the basics of how we as individuals can assist in arresting contamination and spread within the workspace. The management team of the authority was up to speed quickly in ensuring appropriate equipment and provide to our most valuable asset, which is our staff. Management also briskly went about implementing the core social distancing protocols. Virtual meetings became standardized, stay-at-home work was instituted, signposting at key points in the authority, basic COVID management instructions were broadcast through the authority's public announcement system at the RLB, International Airport, erection of sanitizer station throughout the workspace. Six feet spacing markings were placed at the appropriate stations for both staff and the general public. In brief, a full embrace of the recent established COVID-19 pandemic regulation demonstrating the authority's commitment to support the wider national fight.
to contain the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The staff of the, of the authority <clears throat> has been exemplary in the performance over the long haul. It was not easy to be on the front line, especially in the early stages of the heightened panic and fear due to the uncertainty and also 24-hour churning of the social media platform with so much false fakes, fake news, and maybe at the stage a genuine misinformed public. My event was, cha was challenged by the early reaction of staff, but through persuasion and the constant internal communication and feedback updates by the COVID-19 strategy team, some fears have been subsided and or even eliminated. The workforce then settled down to what they do best, serve the public. The staff of the operations department continued to belt out outstanding performances. Although it was all hand on deck across the authority, I wish to make mention of a specific team at the risk of being pillowed by other members of staff. And that team is Mr. Wilson and his team of operators and operatives, warehouse staffers who stack and unstack the cargo sheds in the most difficult times, even at the expense of missing out on the panic shopping days. The eat food too have health issues, family matters, just like the rest of us, but they were out very early in the morning and late at night, working the containers to ensure the supermarkets, the pharmacies are well stocked. But it is in such times that we test the commitment to the sacred motto of our nation, country above self. And at least for once in their lifetime, or in the lifetime of our staff, it was demonstrated commendation to the outstanding staff of the authority. Communication, like all other organizations, we use very wind media uh, com uh, to communicate to the general public. What is very important, and I pull this up from the McKenzie Company with respect to communication, during these times, improve the transparency and velocity of information inside the organization and between its critical stakeholders. We had web posting, teleconferencing, email, etc. Our key areas of facilitating trade and enhancing the efficiency and ensuring the goods arrive at the final destination in the Federation is the waiver of storage fees. This is one of the other facets that we added to our service. The elimination of fees and customers, both commercial and private individuals, benefited significantly from this gesture. It was one way of accelerating the rate at which we can get people's goods out of our space. I would just go to some statistics. Interesting. Cargo. During that period, we have seen a gradual um, falling off of falling off of um, cargo, which is expected, because during that time, the focus was on now for now shopping. Let me hoard what I can get within syndicates. And because of that, we would have seen a fall off in the arrival of containers. But during that, during that period,
during that period, we would have seen a decline in the number of containers hitting our shores. And we would have noticed something that was very strange. The only area we did not have a decline in was motor vehicles. Food fell, containers, quantity fell. But for cars, motor vehicles, we have seen an increase in that. The authority, even though there was a parcel closed down, we had activity still at the airport. On a daily basis, <clears throat> we assist in flights, mostly taking passengers out of the Federation. But today we had the opportunity to welcome in, I think it was stated about 54 persons, our students from overseas, from Jamaica. So we are still facilitating. There's still cargo movement at the airport, not only at the city, but at the airport. On daily, every Tuesday we have a marriage jet and the cargo is facilitated, the movement of cargo is facilitated through the airport. We also have activity based on the courier service. That is also facilitated. So what is important is that our role, even though diminished in some areas, its importance, its importance has not diminished. And the institution is committed to performing and to execute his mandate, which is facilitate trade in the interest of the Federation. We also would like to say thank you for this platform, because it gives us an opportunity to let the Federation know that the institution, SCASPA, continues to work and will not lose any steam in performing that role in satisfying the people of the nation. I'd like to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. James, the CEO of SCASPA. I would now invite the general manager of the St. Kitts Electricity Company, Skellic, Mr. Joma Williams, to address us. Mr. Williams. Good evening. It's indeed a pleasure for me to be here today to give a presentation on behalf of Skellig. <clears throat> the Sankey's Electricity Company, recognizing our role as the sole provider of electricity in Sankey's, began our preparation for COVID-19 as early as January of this year. Skellig was one of the first companies to invite the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hazel Laws, and the NEMA Director, Abdiya Samuel, to sensitize our staff on the virus. We devised plans to ensure the supply of electricity during restrictions on movement related to COVID-19 would remain constant. Our measures have included heightened sanitization at our three locations, restricted access to our power station and transmission and distribution campuses, limited access to our admin, also provided our staff with equipment to facilitate work from home. Just as Skellig has been impacted by COVID-19, we recognize that this pandemic has caused financial hardship for some of our customers. Through, through the government of St. Kitts and Nevis, we are able to provide relief to our customers in need. In 
March, Skellig launched a moratorium on bail payments for April, May, and June. This means that eligible customers can receive a deferment on payments of their electricity bills. Please note, this does not mean that customers are not expected to pay, but rather they are not expected to make payment until the moratorium ends. Customers who qualify for the moratorium must note the following. The next payment due for the March bill, which must be paid on or before July 20th, July 2020. If possible, customers are encouraged to make payments during April to June. After the moratorium ends, customers must make arrangement with Skellig to bring their account up to date. To qualify for the moratorium, applicants must show proof of financial impact due to the econ economic fallout of COVID-19 by providing a letter from their employer confirming such impact. Customers can also submit documentation proving self-employment within the tour tourism or other affected sector. To date, 74 customers have applied for the moratorium. We are encouraging any customer who has been financially impacted by COVID-19 to apply for the moratorium. Customers with email should send their name, account number, and documents showing proof of financial impact to customer service at skelec.kn and complete our deferred payment form found on the website skelec.kn to apply for our three-month moratorium. Alternatively, customers can call our customer service department at 465-2000. Due to the imposed restriction of movement, our meter readers are unable to physically collect meter readings. As such, 6,628 customers, roughly 31% of our accounts, will receive an estimated bill for April. April's estimated bill will be calculated using an average of customers' January, February, and March bill. Customers who have received an estimated bill will see a change of the billing code on the inside of the bill. These bills will include the letter E, which indicates an estimated reading. Skellig aims to follow up with the actual reading in the next billing period once regulations allow. As we continue to practice social and physical distancing, we are encouraging our customers to sign up for our online <coughs> billing platform, eBiz. With eBiz, customers can view bills online, receive bills via email, make payments online, view billing and usage history, report faults, and calculate bills. To use our eBiz platform, customers can apply online at ebiz.skelec.kn. To apply, customers will need to provide two forms of identification and will also need their account information at hand. For April, we saw a 200% increase in eBiz sign-up. In addition to eBiz, customers can also make bill payments through St. Kitts, Nevis, and Guilla National Bank, First Caribbean Bank, and Republic, Republic Bank online portal. The public can also pay using our checkbox at our main office on Central Street. We are currently preparing to roll out an automated call-in service to accept bill payments and receive reports for customers via telephone. 
We understand that during the days of limited operations that some of our customers may not be able to visit our main office and we often have a high call load. We are reminding our customers that most of our services can be accessed to our website, skelec.kn. Through our website, customers can apply for new supply transfer of supply, disconnection payment plan, 19 deferred payment plan, and report faults and outages. Customers can also access these features through Skelex mobile app, which can be downloaded from the Apple and Google Play Store. Alternatively, customers can contact us using our Facebook page, Skelec, Sankey's Electricity Company, or by emailing customer service at skelec.kn for service inquiries or info at skelec.kn for general inquiries. Customers can also call 465-2000 or 465-2013 for emergencies or 600 from a mobile phone. While we do not encourage visits to our, while we do not discourage visits to our office, for customers who choose to do so, please note that we are open from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. on partial curfew days. We have limited access to only a few customers at a time. Our customers will be asked to sanitize their hands and obey physical distancing protocols. Only customers wearing masks will be allowed to enter our customer service and cashier department. St. Kitts Electricity Company has begun installing new LED efficient street lights as of Monday 20th of April under the street and floodlight retrofit project. The first phase of the installation includes a changeover of over 5,000 lamps to LED. The project began with a changeover of lamps on the FD Williams Highway at the Camps Roundabout, continuing east on the Island Main Road. 26 environmentally sensitive amber lights or turtle friendly lights will be installed on the island main road in Keys and through the Keys community to protect turtles that nest on Keys Beach. While we continue to work together to contain the spread of COVID-19, let us not forget the upcoming hurricane season. At Skellic, we have already begun hurricane preparedness plans. We are taking this time to encourage the public to begin their individual and household preparation for the, the upcoming hurricane season. I want to thank the public for its understanding during this time. And most importantly, I want to express my gratitude to the staff of Skellic who continue to go above and beyond the call of duty to ensure that we continue to supply electricity. You are an essential part of Skellic. You are an essential part of the Skellic family and the country. These have been extremely challenging times for Skellic and the people of the Federation. I want to remind you that Skellic is the crew that's always with you. And we, can, we are committed to providing electricity with reliabi reliability and responsibility. And in closing, I just want to remind everybody to continue to wash your hands and don't let anybody cough in your face. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I recognize among us the esteemed Honorable Attorney General, Honorable Vincent Byron, and also I recognize the Minister of State with Responsibility for Health, the Honorable Wendy Phipps. 
I now invite Superintendent Cromwell Henry, Divisional Commander for District A, to give us his report. Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Williams. A pleasant good afternoon to all. I will begin my report as usual with arrests. For the past 24 hours, police have made four arrests of persons in breach of the emergency regulations. However, what is different today is that three of those arrests were for persons who were not wearing masks. So three persons were arrested for failing to wear their masks and one for breach of curfew. Now, all four persons were arrested and charged. Today, the total number of persons arrested under the emergency regulations uh, is 101. We believe that the public is sufficiently sensitized about the wearing of masks. And so, the time has come for enforcement. We will continue to make our appeals to residents to adhere to all the provisions of the emergency regulations, particularly the social and physical distancing reg protocols, the hygiene protocols, the wearing of masks, and the shelter in place protocols, shelter in place order. I will now give some information from the Inland Revenue Department. Due to the social distancing protocols that are being observed at the Inland Revenue Department by the staff and taxpayers alike, there has been some delays in the processing of licenses. The deadline for the licensing of vehicles ending with three and four has therefore been extended to May 8th. So persons with vehicles with registration numbers ending with three and four, your dead, the deadline for the licensing, the renewal of your licenses has been extended to May 8th, 2020. Persons who have renewed their licenses online and are waiting for the license to be processed should keep the online receipt with them so that if you are stopped by the police, you can present this receipt to the police. You should also present the old or the expired license along with your receipt when requested by the police. The Inland Revenue wishes to continue to encourage taxpayers to use their online portal to renew your licenses. And of course, this will reduce the time you may have to wait in lines at the office. Today's limited operation period ends at 7 p.m. The nightly curfew begins at 7.01 p.m. and runs until 5.59 a.m. tomorrow. Tomorrow is the final day of limited operation days for this week which starts at 6 a.m. We ask residents to observe the curfews and complete all of your activities within the time frame allotted and be off the streets during the hours of the curfew, 6, 7.01 p.m. until 5.59 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Henry. I now invite Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hazel Laws, to give us her report. Dr. Laws. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and good afternoon to everyone. As of today, Thursday, 
the 30th of April 2020 at 3 p.m., the World Health Organization reports 3,090,445 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, with 217,769 deaths. To date, 293 persons have been sampled and tested with 15 confirmed positive, 271 confirmed negative, and seven results pending. Six confirmed cases have recovered with zero deaths to date. Currently, 56 persons are quarantined in a government facility, while 55 persons are quarantined at home. Nine persons remain in isolation, while 688 persons have been released from quarantine. On March the 25th, 2020, just over a month ago, the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis announced its first two confirmed cases of COVID-19. Presently, as at today, April the 30th, 2020, the Federation recorded a total of 15 confirmed COVID-19 cases. The confirmed cases comprise of 53% males and 47% females, with 60% of the cases between the ages of 21 and 40 years. The age of the patients ranged from nine months to 66 years, and the mean or average age is 32 years. In terms of clinical manifestation, 87% were symptomatic or they manifested symptoms, and the remainder were symptom-free. The most common symptoms, as I said before, are fever, cough, and sore throat. To date, six cases recovered with an average duration of 27 days between diagnosis and recovery. 293 persons have been sampled and tested, with 93% of these receiving negative results, 5% receiving positive results, and the remaining were, are pending. So far, the public health team has traced and tested over 193 contacts of cases and 3% or five contacts were positive. Testing of suspected cases of COVID-19 and contacts remain a priority for the Ministry of Health. Be reminded that each of us have our part to play in protecting ourselves and others from this disease, maintaining the overall health of the people of the Federation continues to be our individual and collective responsibility. I want to remind us that the national statistics and other COVID-19 related information can be found at the official website www.covid19.gov.kn, the St. Kitts Health Promotion Unit Facebook page, and the St. Kitts Health Promotion Unit YouTube channel and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Laws. I now invite Mr. Abdias Samuel, Chair of the COVID-19 National Task Force, to address us. Mr. Samuel. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and greetings and uh, to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone, sorry. Those who are tuning via the internet, those listening via radio, and those watching on television. Today, I want to start off today on a very happy note. Nothing is, as we say, sweeter than when a plan comes together and you see it come to fruition. 
Today I was happy to witness the arrival of 51 students that was that were are studying sorry in Jamaica. Uh, it was a very happy moment for parents, for the students, for those who have been working hard, and in particular for the nation at large. Thank you very much to all of uh, you who supported this operation, and uh, we look forward to supporting everyone who has such dire need. Let me be begin with acknowledgments. Today I want to acknowledge the Keys Gospel Hall Church who donated $1,500 to support the fight against COVID-19. So the, the Keys Gospel Hall Church, thank you very much. We also thank Faith's Bakery for the donation of bread and pastries to the vulnerable persons within the community, including the Children's Home, Carding Home, and Carding Home, New, New Horizon, and the NEOC. So the Faith's Family Bakery, I see one of them here sitting with us. Thank you very much, and we look forward to your continued partnership. I also want to acknowledge, by uh, way of reading this extract from a WhatsApp message, message from Dr. Bernal S. Nisbet, and it states, Terry and Wilma Nisbet, who are kitchen residing in St. Croix, they wish to inform that they are following the daily briefing by the NEOC and that they are extremely impressed by the, by, the, by the dedication, hard work, and professionalism of this group of nationals of the Federation. They declare that they are moved by the astute leadership of the Prime Minister, Dr. Timothy Harris, and his cabinet, and it makes them feel proud to be nationals of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, especially at this time of crisis. This, this small initial token makes them feel a part of the valiant effort undertaken there in the fight against COVID. And they have contributed a check of in the amount of 1,000 EC dollars. Permanent Secretary under the Ministry of National Security, Mr. Osman Petty, wishes to highlight the work that is being done by IMPACTS, the Implementation Agency for, the, for Crime and Security. Dear Mr. P Sorry, dear Permanent Secretary Petty, please find enclosed in this package three thermometers which can be used by law enforcement and or prisons as a part of the fight against the COVID-19 virus. In our discussions with the various standing committees, many law enforcement entities indicated they needed these thermometers to test their officers on a daily basis, and in the case of prisons, it would be a case of testing both inmates and wardens. So, I recognize that this is, a, this is but a small contribution, but one of the hopefully more to come. This contribution is out of the core budget, and we are hopeful of acquiring funding to provide further supplies, which are immediately required. Please let us know what other urgent supplies may be required by the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. The agency remains committed to serving the government of St. Kitts and Nevis, and thank you for your continued support. Sincerely, Michael Jones, Executive Director, Acting. I also want to acknowledge a small but generous contribution that was made by highly spirited citizens in the Pons Extension area. She asked me not, she and he asked me not to reveal their names, but they were moved as well as citizens of this land to make a contribution to the fight. And this contribution, they would like to go to the children's home. The amount donated was 500 EC dollars in cash that was delivered to my office. 
So to you, thank you, and we appreciate your effort. Large or small, they are all welcome. I also want to acknowledge Jaida Sutton, President of the Students Association in Jamaica for her tremendous leadership. She needs to be lauded for her commitment and astute leadership shown during the time of the only terms of dialogue between the government, agencies, and the students, parents who are studying in Jamaica. I also want to thank Ambassador of the Republic, China, Taiwan, His Excellency, Tom Lee, and the Taiwanese Embassy and staff who readily assisted us in translating our regulation 15 of 2020 to Mandarin. We have we continuous, continuously state that we are approaching this fight against COVID with an all of societies approach. The operation today of bringing our students to St. Kitts and Nevis was a multi-sectorial and multi-agency operation. First, let me thank the members of cabinet, in particular, the Deputy Prime Minister. And I also want to acknowledge the police, Defense Force, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Health, St. Kitts and Nevis, Immigration, Customs, SCASPA, NASPA, the EOC and Nevis, NEOC and St. Kitts, TDC Group of Companies, and also the bus drivers. Everyone played their part, and also the security, private security who assisted our police and defense force. Thank you everyone, and I'm certain the parents of these students are extremely happy. 311, a total of 33 calls were experienced for the past 24 hours. 30 on St. Kitts, 3 on Nevis. 911, 96 calls. NEOC, seven calls. One, social distancing, one, health, one, permission to move during the coffee hours, one, seeking general information, and three, and social welfare assistance. The EOC and Nevis with a process a total of 14 calls. The COVID Compliance Task Force would have visited a total of 74 businesses today and would engage 28 passenger buses. Out of the 28 passenger buses, only one driver was not wearing his mask. Again, let me repeat, one driver was not wearing his mask, and I am appealing to citizens if the driver is not wearing his mask, advising driver, put on your mask. I am also advised by the Compliance Task Force that only one supermarket had no compliance whatsoever. That is not good. I'm appealing to this supermarket, you know who you are, if you're listening, please become compliant. As of next week, we will be enforcing the law to its fullest extent. The quarantine task force continues to do to ensure that persons are compliant with their obligations and persons, I am being told now, are sheltering in place. I want to present some t statistics that was presented to us. For the businesses, businesses adhering to six feet of distancing, 42 out of the 79 visited today. Those who have markers inside and outside of the businesses, only 40 out of the 78 visited. Personal hygiene, those numbers, as I read here, are more acceptable than before. Again, I'm gonna make this last appeal to you. Please comply, today is Thursday, 
Tomorrow will be Friday. After Friday comes Monday, we are enforcing the law. This means if we have to shut you down, we will shut you down in the interest of public safety. We have been very, very accommodative in educating you one week, evaluating you, and making recommendations for two weeks, and now it's time to enforce the law. I am appealing to you. I will be engaging the Chamber of Industry and Commerce for further discussion. And I again state with to you, we will be ensuring that you comply with the regulations. With that said, I want to thank you very much for listening, and we will now engage in questions and hopefully get you some good answers. Thank you, Mr. Samuel. We have now arrived at the question and answer segment. I see some persons in the room. Of course, we have the Honorable Attorney General. We have the Honorable Senator, Wendy Phipps. We have the Public Relations Officer from Skellig, Mr. Gawain Fritz. We have the Communications Manager at Skellig, Ms. Patrice Harris. We have the General Manager of Skellig, Mr. Jomo Williams. We have Superintendent Cromwell Henry. We have in the room also the Comptroller of Customs, Mr. Kennedy Silver, our Medical Chief of Staff, Dr. Cameron Wilkinson, and our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hazel Laws. We also have the CEO of SCASPER, Mr. Don James. Your questions can be based, of course, on the presentations that were made. And you can specify who you would like to answer a particular question. The first question. Sometime last week, this one is for the Attorney General. Sometime last week, a lawyer told me that the Constitution has no allowances for the postponement of elections. Of course, the framers of the Constitution never expected something like this pandemic to overtake St. Kitts. In the absence of a provision in the Constitution, if this pandemic continues, how are we going to deal with the elections and remain in the parameters of the Constitution? I hasten to add, the lawyer was not being political when he gave his opinion based on his reading of the Constitution. Attorney General. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for that question. <clears throat> we are aware that the Constitution requires that five years after the first hearing of Parliament, or the first sitting of Parliament, after an election, Parliament dissolves so that the first hearing would have been in May 14th, 2015, and on May 14th, 2020, the Parliament automatically dissolves unless His Excellency the Governor-General is asked by the Honorable Prime Minister to do so. The Prime Minister has the authority under the Constitution to request Parliament to be dissolved. When Parliament is dissolved, prorogued, as is said in the, or prorogued in the Constitution, by the Constitution, there are 90 days by which a general election should be held. So that if Parliament was to be dissolved automatically, no later than May the 14th in 2020, 
90 days from then it may well be something like the 11th of August of this year when there must be uh, a general election under the Constitution. I would not want to get into further legal discussion, but there may well be common law principles that may be invoked or used before a court if there is a need to, um, on the necessity to extend um, or to delay or postpone uh, an election. At this point in time, that is not envisaged, and we would hope that we will be able to conduct a general election within the constitutionally mandated frame. And so it is not contemplated that elections should extend beyond the 11th of August this year. And um, questions of common law, questions of necessity and so forth do not pertain as we are not in that situation at this point in time and we depend on our medical professionals to guide and advise us as to how we will be able to conduct this fight against COVID and how we live over the next 90 days and more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney General. This question is for the Comptroller of Customs. Is there any arrangement made for persons who would have imported personal vehicles? Has any arrangement been made during this time for them? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we would appreciate that most people would have perhaps purchased a vehicle while the economy was um, good, um, pre-COVID-19. Uh, however, there are vehicles here, and I guess the, the economic situations for individuals would have changed by then. What we're asking people to do, if they have a concern, they can come to the Comptroller's office and discuss their individual um, difficulties, and we'll see what, if any, arrangements could be made to um, alleviate the, the difficulties that we have in paying the duties and taxes. one is for Superintendent Henry. When a person is arrested for breaking the curfew, how, how long will they remain in custody? Are they being charged on the same day? And finally, will they be given a meal by the police, or is the family allowed to bring them a meal? Generally, within 48 hours, that person is charged and, and, and bail within 48 hours, generally. And in terms of meal, yes, a family member can bring a meal. If no one brings a meal, then the police will provide meal for them. This is from SKN Newsline. There continues to be varying opinions about the effectiveness of cloth masks in protecting wearers from contracting COVID-19. Kindly explain the following. A, how effective are cloth masks? 
in protecting individuals from getting COVID-19. B, various people, manufacturers, are make, making masks. What should be the minimum structure in making these masks that consumers should be aware of? And C, who monitors the standards of these masks to ensure consumers are getting the right standard of masks? Second question. Okay, Dr. Wilkinson. Thank you for the question. One of the things that we've said before is that the purpose of wearing the mask is not to protect you from someone else, but to prevent you from spreading your respiratory droplets. And so when you go out, if you talk, sneeze, cough, you can uh, expel respiratory droplets that can go at least three feet. And so there are two things that you need to do when you go out to, uh, to prevent yourself from infecting someone else and also to protect yourself. Number one, you need to stay at least six feet from someone. And by staying six feet from the other person, you will be protecting yourself. By wearing your mask, you prevent your respiratory droplets from traveling and infecting someone else. And the World Health Organization, the CDC, they have said that just by wearing a basic bandana, that it will be effective in controlling the droplets. So anything above a bandana is also good. And so if you cannot afford to buy one of the simplest masks, then you can use a cloth, cloth face mask. And so basically what we're saying is that everyone has the ability to cover their nose, cover their mouth, and prevent themselves from spreading the virus. Because the way we will control this virus is assuming that when you go out, you might be infectious. And by you controlling your respiratory droplets, you can prevent the spread of the virus. The other person who is next to you might also be infectious. And the way you control that is by making sure you stay six feet away from them. Because the droplets from that person doesn't necessarily have to go directly into your nose or mouth. It can go onto your hand, onto the things that you were carrying around, and then you can touch that, contaminate your hands, you put it into your nose or mouth, and then you become infected. Okay? Thank you. Scan news line. In relation to the students who arrived from Jamaica, can you indicate how they are being quarantined or where they are being quarantined? And will all of them be tested for COVID 19? Mr. Williams, thank you for the question, and thanks for whoever posted the question. Uh, let me answer the first part of the question. The students are quarantined in a government facility, and they are very well accommodated. As you just heard, the students are quarantined in a government uh, assigned facility and they will be observed with regards to the development of signs and symptoms of COVID-19. And yes, of course, they'll be tested. Thank you. Small business owners, is there anything in place for small business owners whose business is impacted by this pandemic? Whether or not they are registered at Social Security as self-employed. I operate 
a, a, a business on weeknights, especially Fridays and Saturdays, running my grill, etc. But because of the curfew, I can't be open, so therefore, I'm not making any money, only my next to nothing pension. Attorney General. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are in an abnormal time, an unusual time, when the world is in a pandemic and that we have had to have emergency powers in order to protect all our citizens from an infectious disease. And there will be some hardship, and we hope that we can do as much as we can to sort of ease that hardship from time to time. The advice we have had from our medical professionals is that socialization, whether at bars, night spots, in the evening at restaurants, in close proximity to each other, is one way in which, as Dr. Wilkerson was just explaining, droplets may be transmitted to others. And so it's that socialization, that social gathering, that why it is that we have put in place nightly curfews and lockdowns on the weekends so that we can slow down the transmission of COVID-19, of the transmission of this virus. If it is that you have been having difficulty making ends meet, the government has put in place certain packages to assist you to go over this very difficult time until we can really get back to some level of normalcy. We hope that as a business owner, small business owner, you should have signed up for small business um, uh, contributions with Social Security, which you can now draw on. There are other areas, if it is, that as a householder, you may be making less than $3,000, or have an income of less than $3,000 per month. You should qualify for the Poverty Alleviation Program that allows for households making less than $3,000 to get $500 to assist them with basic necessities. But we are in an abnormal time. It's a special time, and all of us have to find a way to make ends meet until we can see our way to get back to some level of normalcy. And hopefully that will happen soon, but we do not know. And we depend on our medical professionals to advise us when that is the proper time, an appropriate time for us to do so. Thank you very much. And this is our last question for the day. Are gyms allowed to operate? Gymnasiums. The regulation provides that if a business can operate while observing the social and physical distancing protocol, as well as the other hygiene protocol, they can operate. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank you for your questions, and I do hope that they were adequately answered. I do have an announcement that was sent to me from Western Union. That the Western Union office is closed until further notice. 
the management says that the closure is necessary to resolve some internal issues with its principal, Grace Kennedy Money Services. We are aware that everyone is facing unprecedented circumstances brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, and as such, it requires certain internal adjustments that were unforeseeable before this pandemic. I wish to take this opportunity to dispel the notion that our office has monies for the customers. We are not to dispel the notion that our office has monies for the customers. We are not a bank, so we do not hold deposits for anyone. The business is predominantly a cash-in-hand-out business. So as customers send monies out, those same funds are used to pay customers who are collecting. Also, transfers that originate from overseas jurisdictions destined for a location do not generate any funds at our location. The internal reconciliation process allows for ACM to recoup any funds outstanding. We wish to assure all our customers that we are working with our principals to resolve the issues as quickly as possible. Until then, please listen for our announcement with regard to our reopening. On behalf of Advantage Capital Management Limited, Austin Julius, General Manager. We do apologize for the late start we had today because of situations beyond our control. Tomorrow we are going to have a representative who will speak on the Poverty Alleviation Program, the PAP, tomorrow at the briefing. I would like to thank all of our presenters for today, Mr. Don James, the CEO of SCASPA, Mr. Joe Williams, General Manager of Skellec, Superintendent Henry, our CMO, Dr. Hazel Laws, Mr. Abdias Samuel. I also would like to thank our Attorney General, the Honorable Vincent Byron, the Honorable Minister of State with Responsibility for Health, the Honorable Wendy Phipps, our Comptroller of Customs, Mr. Kennedy De Silva, our sign language expert, Mrs. Christmas Jacobs, who continues to do a fabulous job. I want to thank all our media who continue to partner with us in getting the information out and keeping you informed as well in terms of what is happening here in St. Kitts and Nevis. ZIZ, Nevis TV, Win FM, all the Freedom FM, Sugar FM, Sugar City FM, all the radio stations in the Federation, and also Caribbean Broadcasting Network in the Virgin Islands owned by a Mr. Mr. Andrew Cox, who generously carries this briefing every day, carries it live. Tomorrow we will be back for another briefing at 5 p.m. Until then, continue to be safe and do all that you're supposed to do to prevent yourself from being sick. Here in June to 1 FM 98.9, the time approximately 16 minutes moving up to the 7 o'clock hour. We now bring you to Win FM News and Sports. You found the sound 98.9. Win, 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 win FM. FM.
We now bring you the Win FM News. The Win FM News is brought to you by Flo, The Cable, Rams, and SL Hospitals and Company Limited. As social distancing becomes the norm of our everyday life, the cable wants you, our customer, to know that we are here for you every day. Just log in to us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Send us your feedback at email, service at thecable.biz. Visit our website, www.thecable.net. It's also nice to know you can pay your bills at a distance, online at all commercial banks, or at www.thecable.net forward slash pay. Now's the time to try online banking. It's ultra easy. Call us at 465-2588-662-7742 or 763-0184. The Cable, we're here for you. Essential Everyday and Equiline. Spend less on our Essential Everyday products and get the best quality, the best taste, and the best value. Spend less for all your family health and beauty needs with the Equiline brand of over-the-counter products. Sportsman's Value Mart IGA is helping you spend less, spend less with our Essential Everyday products and Equiline over-the-counter health and beauty care products. Shop smart and spend less, spend less. at Value Mart, where price matters most. Maybe it's the way the brilliant gold liquid reflects our sunshine, or how the bright blue of its label mirrors the clear Caribbean skies overhead. Maybe it's the fresh, crisp taste of this beastly cold beer on a scorching hot day. Maybe it's even the way it brings us all together. But one thing is for sure, Carib is very much a part of who we are wherever we're from in the Caribbean. Carib. It's the way we play. Drink responsibly. With Do FM News, I am German Abel. I am Ken Richards. And now the news. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Hazel Laws is giving a situation report on St. Kitts and Nevis when it comes to COVID-19. To date, 293 persons have been sampled and tested with 15 confirmed positive 271 confirmed negative and seven results pending. Six confirmed cases have recovered with zero deaths to date. Currently, 56 persons are quarantined in a government facility while 55 persons are quarantined at home. Nine persons remain in isolation while 688 persons have been released from quarantine. Dr. Laws gave a breakdown of those infected and those who showed symptoms. Presently, as at today, April the 30th, 2020, the Federation recorded a total of 15 confirmed COVID-19 cases. The confirmed cases comprise of 53% males, and 47% females, with 60% of the cases between the ages of 21 and 40 years. The age of the patients ranged from nine months to 66 years, and the mean or average age is 32 years. 
In terms of clinical manifestation, 87% were symptomatic or they manifested symptoms and the remainder were symptom free. The most common symptoms, as I said before, are fever, cough, and sore throat. To date, six cases recovered with an average duration of 27 days between diagnosis and recovery. She also spoke to contact tracing. 290.